Hi, good evening, everyone. We're so excited to have you here. It is July 1st. I can't believe we're halfway finished with, um, with 2021, but it's good. So um, July is officially BIPOC Mental Health Awareness Month, and we're just excited to continue to feature mental health professionals and mental health advocates. And I feel this, I feel July is like Christmas <laughs> because it's just a really, a really great opportunity to highlight our mental health professionals in, in, in the field and to highlight the work that they're doing. So today we are gonna be speaking with Catherine Everin Rowe, who um, is a therapist in private practice and also um, a group facilitator with the COVID Grief Network. So we'll, we'll learn a little, little bit about that tonight. But before that, I just wanna give an introduction um, about InnoCyc for those of you who, who may not be familiar with us. Um, so we are an organization that's charged with disrupting racial inequities in mental health. Our goal is really to make it faster and easier for people of color to find therapists of color. We want to change that search process that can often take six months or more to two weeks and really want to give people the choice in therapists that they want. Um, I think it's really about choice. And the reason why we do these conversations is really about changing the narrative about mental health and really destigmatizing it and making mental health conversations normal, a normal part of our routine in our daily life. So that's our mission. Um, we have um, a really cool directory, which there's no charge for therapists to be featured on that directory. Um, and we feature therapists across the country. So if you are a therapist, we really invite you to join our network. Every day we get requests for therapists and, you know, <laughs> therapists of color, we're not that many in the field. And so people are filling up fast. So really want to make sure that when someone has made that decision to see a therapist, that they can come and find one. So we really invite you to be, to sign up and to register. And if you know someone, please invite them to be part of our network as well. We do have a campaign where we're giving away a free journal. So if you, if you have some therapists of color in your network, um, please reach out to us and we will get, get them signed up and you get a little gift in, in response in reward for that. Um, we have an ambitious goal to bring in 2021 therapists this year. Um, and I say it's ambitious because it is. Uh, but we know you're out there and we really want to make sure that we get you featured. And finally, the other thing that we offer is we are really engaged in, again, like, again, trying to make mental health mainstream, right? That used to be one of my taglines, actually. So we've created different ways for people to engage. So we have a card deck called the My Time to Thrive card deck um, that really, again, really fosters open conversations about emotional health and healing. We have the journal and then we just, we have some, some gear. So this is one, this is called Thriving Looks Like This. This is a new one that's, that's dropped this month. And then we have another one, which you might've seen um, in our social media, um, go get a therapist. So lots of exciting things. And then the last big news I want to share with you, um, I forgot to add that slide in today, but we were featured yesterday on NPR. They did a feature on InnoPsych and our mission to really promote therapy and to bring more therapists of color into our network. So, um, so it's so exciting. So really cool. Um, again, if you aren't following us, follow us on our social media at InnoPsych and you can get that information. All right. So thank you all for being here. And just remember that um, we love hearing where you're at. So just pop in your name in the chat, um, where you're at, and something that made you smile today. Um, and we will get going. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And then we're, we're going to focus on talking with Catherine. So um, I love having these conversations. And I've seen um, M Mia was uh, actually Mia and Francis Parquet, who's my mom. <laughs> They've been guests on Thriving Thursdays. And Dr. Ryan Warner is um, going to be featured in a couple of weeks. So I'm excited to see you here, Ryan. 
Um, so yeah, let's get started. So Catherine, this is gonna be easy. I, I make it comfortable. Um, we're really about trying to uh, make this conversational. And so really how I start all of our conversations is what drove you? What is your inspiration for wanting to be a therapist? Um, you know, for many of us, um, people of color, we're often given negative messages about therapy, right? We, we heard it doesn't exist. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your own journey coming into this field and how you, yeah, how like that maybe was a childhood dream, maybe not, right? But what was that inspiration? What was that light bulb for you that this is the thing I want to do? Yeah. Um, thanks for the question. I mean, if, you know, sometimes I think about it and like, it's really quite strange that I, um, that I wanted, I wanted to be a therapist at a really young age, like four or five. And I remember, um, just intense curiosity about people. Um, and also, um, I, I grew up in a family where a lot of things went unsaid. Um, and that for whatever reason, that just was never, that did not work for me. <laughs> and I really wanted to understand what was actually going on or could often feel that something just wasn't quite right. And it's like, ah, there's something more here. And, you know, I think in some ways that, uh, that sort of natural inclination that was also probably somehow brought out of me in my family context led both to, you know, some things that I think of as challenges in terms of all kinds of funky role reversal things in the family and whatever, mm -hmm. um, but also helped uh, grow what I think of as some of my primary gifts as a human being um, in terms of sort of sensing into what's really going on, observing things, kind of pulling, pulling things out of this. Um, so yeah. I wanted to be a therapist at a really young age. And I also really remember particularly being passionate about um, racial issues as they uh, intersected with mental health and the ways that people feel about themselves. And I didn't have that language for it when I was little. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I remember really wanting to understand about power dynamics, particularly for... Um, power and oppression around racial issues, particularly for black folks, um, and uh, was aware that there were a lot of things happening around me that were impacting the way that I was feeling about myself and about what felt possible for me in the world, and um, I was just really kind of doggedly curious about that, and I mm -hmm. think that those were things that um, sort of set me on this path. Um, I didn't, it wasn't a totally linear journey. Like I, by the time I got to college, I was like, oh, I don't know. Maybe I want to be an English professor. Maybe I want to be a doctor. Maybe, I, I don't know. Um, but I, I found my way back because this, this has always been sort of at the core of what motivates me as a human being. Kind of mm -hmm. Greater mm -hmm. understanding of what's happening kind of both in like individual psyche, but also on a systemic level. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the start. <laughs> yeah, so it sounds like, uh, so a child, there was always a childhood curiosity, if we use curiosity and maybe observing dynamics that you're like, mm -mm, this is not working for me. Yeah. Uh, but it sounds like in college it's, or later on is when it kind of like sunk in for you, like, oh, this is something I want to pursue. Yeah, like, you know, I, I think I really, by the time I got to college, um, I just found myself gravitating more and more toward things that would help me learn about trauma and racial trauma in particular. You know, I think, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I imagine it's not such a secret. Like so many therapists find their way here partially in trying to understand some things about their own experiences. Um, yeah. And I think that was certainly the case for me as well. Um, and yeah, but that's just sort of, it's what I was passionate about. And, um, mm -hmm. I, after college, I was a youth worker for many years. So I worked in like a kind of youth empowerment setting where I was working with teens on farms and um, they were learning about power and oppression through learning about food system, the food system mm -hmm. and why mm -hmm. different folks have varying levels of access to food. 
Um, mm. So it was my job in that role to um, be writing curriculum and helping helping the young people learn about that. Um, but also in that role, I was working very closely with teens and getting a lot of access to a sense of sort of what their lives were like and what they were going through. And um, it was really there that I got really clear that I wanted to pivot back to or pivot towards clinical settings where I could really be doing like therapy work with folks because there was just so much more that I wanted to be able to dig into with them that was outside of the scope of my job and my training. Right, right, um, right. And I just right. that I wanted to be able to offer more. Yeah. I also, yeah, similar to you, I was really, um, I worked a lot with young people and that even, like I remember being 15 and wanted to be a therapist. And I remember like I was doing therapy with my friends and, uh, you know, helping them navigate, you know, different things in their life. Um, but that was definitely the, the, you know, I think that, and working with young people has been such a joy. There is such a, um, there's this, the spirit for life, right? But also they'll, they'll, you know, they keep you on guard. They check you. Right? Oh yeah. But they also keep you current. I'm like, you know, when, when I'm with my youth, I feel like I'm in the know, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's such a different language. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've definitely gotten like progressively less cool in the years that I'm right? outside of working with teens. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, yeah. So tell us a little bit about what you do now, right? What is what is your day to day? What are some things that you're getting into in your work now that you're, you know, professional, right? You've moved through, like you decided this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. yeah. What are the things that you do now? Mm -hmm. Um. So I work both in a college counseling center at Historic Women's College outside Philly at Bernard. And I oh, also- Oh, yeah. yeah. I have a couple of students who've been there. Oh, okay. Went to yeah. school there. Yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. yep. And then I also um, work in a group practice that primarily serves LGBTQ folks in Philly with mostly young adults. And my caseload is um, primarily young adults of color. Um, okay. And yeah, so that's sort of how I earn my living. And then outside of that, I also- do a fair amount of work with the Public Grief Network, which we've talked some about. Um, but it's a sort of mutual aid organization that emerged in response to COVID um, that aims to provide both one on one and group support to young adults who have lost somebody important. Um, in the okay. So I'm going to ask you the question that people ask me all the time. Okay. How do you manage all the, you have, you have told me about three jobs and there may be more you haven't even mentioned. <laughs> yeah, right. How do you manage? And part of the reason, you know, I'm being in jest, but we are, we do have like people who um, tune in or who watch the show who are interested in being um, therapists themselves. So I really love to deconstruct like how, how it is that we put different pieces together, why we choose to maybe work two different jobs versus one right so i'd love yeah. to hear a little bit about um your motivation so you said college counseling um you also work in a group practice and then you also do work with the covid network so yeah break down like how does how does that work out in your week like how many hours are you dedicated are you full-time and those part-time yeah. and how does that kind of being able to do all those different things, how does that feed maybe passions that you have or in your career interests too? Right. Yeah, I do think that having this mix of work um, is partially about kind of different sort of needs of mine in terms of different parts of myself that I want to be able to use. You know? mm -hmm. um, and there's so much about one-on-one -on -one clinical work that's really satisfying. I also find sometimes that when my whole week back to back to back is folks that I'm having one-on-one -on -one 50 minute sessions with who I've seen for years. Um, it can be a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And, but also if I don't have any of that in my week, I feel really unsatisfied because you know, mm. that's something that I really love. And so mm -hmm. it's like, okay, how do I have some of that, but also have some opportunities to use different parts of my brain. I love thinking about programming and facilitating. I love thinking about systems issues. And so like working for an institution, there's an opportunity to be thinking about things that are kind of impacting the college community and ways to mm -hmm. sort of interface with, yeah, different <coughs> organizations on campus or different people in power on campus to help change things. Um, it can be fun to get to do some short-term work with people in that environment and really be kind of a person's first bridge into therapy and sort of help them have a positive short-term experience 
and link them up with someone that they will see longer term. Um, and right. with COVID Group Network, I mean, that's been really cool because we we created a thing. We built this organization from the ground up over the past year. And um, yeah, that's given those of us who've been involved chances to use all different kinds of skills and also to provide yeah. um, something for free for so many people to access in this time of dire need when, you know, we've seen that, yeah, just like the bigger kind of structures in our communities that might provide some sort of support aren't in part because there's mm-hmm. a lot of, um, at least in my opinion, there's been a huge amount of, I don't know, uh, yeah, gaslighting and denial <laughs> around um, COVID and the impact that it's having on people. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, why don't we take a step back? Tell us a little bit about what is the COVID network. Okay. And yeah, it sounds like something that came out of a need um, in response to COVID. So yeah, tell us a little bit about it, um, what your role is with that group, Yeah. Um, what you do. Mm-hmm. So COVID Group Network started with a few folks who are kind of at the core of the organization who had, before COVID, been running these in-person grief retreats for young adults who had lost somebody important to them. Um, the sort of person who had the initial idea had a traumatically mm-hmm. lost her father a few years ago and is someone who you know, was in rabbinical school and has always been passionate about facilitating transformative experiences for people and um, was really excited about this like in-person grief retreat thing that she was able to create in part because in her own experience of grief, she had learned, A, that there aren't actually a lot of spaces for young adults to get support around grief. There are a lot of spaces for children, and there are a lot of spaces for people who are, you know, 40 and up. Um, but so often, if you're in your 20s or 30s and you've lost somebody important and you're in a grief space, you're going to be either the oldest or youngest person in the room, and it's just mm-hmm. kind of not quite for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and and also, you know, this person, Chloe, who helped start the Cook Group Network, had found um, in many different experiences of just facilitating things for groups that so often the most transformative things happen when you can be in community. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when COVID happened and we were all separated, um, you know, there was both an interest in figuring out how to kind of continue this work of supporting young adults who are grieving. There was knowing that, um, you know, there were going to be so many more young adults who were grieving given the demographics of who was dying of COVID in in large numbers. Some people lost parents and grandparents. Um, But some people also lost, you know, best friends, spouses, siblings. Um, And that, you know, this super essential component, the community component that had been such a lifesaver for Chloe was like now so much less accessible to people. Mm -hmm. Um, And so Chloe organized to get a bunch of people around her. She and I have worked together for many years. She actually worked at the same um, youth development empowerment mm-hmm. place as I did when we were when we were much younger and have been collaborating for years on things. Um, and yeah, I got a bunch of people together and said like, okay, what can we do to offer support to this population? Um, and so together, a team, kind of a rotating cast of like 15 to 20 of us um, helped create this very functional organization that has lots of different parts. I've since the beginning have been on our support and training team. So figuring out kind of how we're going to, how to train our volunteers who provide both one-on-one and group grief support. Um, But basically COVID Group Network, their primary offerings have been um, one-on-one, like free one-on-one group support um, up to six sessions. And then also if people are interested, um, access to groups. So we've had these groups that are typically around 10 people and they meet eight times. Um, and they I, meet how, eight times you said? Mm-hmm, okay. Yeah. And some of them have sort of themes or are organized around particular identities. Um, I was able to facilitate our first group, which is a really special experience, which happened over the holidays last year. Um, and yeah, we're, mm. we're continuing with both these offerings and, and we're really finding that our young adults are especially finding group support massively transformative. Um, and so yeah. we're putting a lot of energy there these days. Yeah, yeah. I was really excited when I learned about this organization and the, the group part in particular, right? Because we're coming off of year where 
so many of us were in quarantine isolation and not feeling connected yeah. and you know one of the things that I keep saying to, to anyone who's interested or anyone who listen to me right <laughs> uh, it's not anything profound but I'm like if you're looking to get into the field or if you're licensed and in the field really think about how to pivot to do more group work right one, it does bring that connection that you talk about, but it also, particularly for folks of color, it kind of builds capacity. So as a therapist, seeing eight people in your day, that's pretty high, but versus being able to see maybe 50 or, or more because you are doing group work can be so powerful and can impact those folks who are on a waiting list, right? So I, th but it also brings people together. So I'm really intrigued and I love that you guys we're able to pivot and do this virtually, but also to respond to a really immediate need for those those people, the, the young folks that you you target. Yeah, yeah, and and to be able to provide support that's free, right? Like, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I'm excited to be involved in this because you know, I mean, it's been run entirely on volunteer power thus mm -hmm. far I imagine that will shift some in the future but right. still um mm -hmm. but you know I mean we know therapy is not always super affordable for people and there are so many things that make that so um mm -hmm. and uh you know in terms of you know your question about like okay you have all these jobs like how do you balance <laughs> this why are you do you know I do think part of my work with this group is about you know, my like ethic as a social worker, you know, it's like, I, I just, I really want these services to be accessible. And I'm mm -hmm. grateful that there is a place for me to plug in a few hours a week that helps make this thing possible for so many people to get yeah. support. Um, yeah, we've had almost uh, a thousand one-on-one -on -one sessions happen over this past year that have been for free. We've wow. Had, I think, 10 groups. Um, and mm -hmm. did, we've worked with young adults in 40 states and 17 countries. Um, wow. Oh my gosh. The reach is broad. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, it's like I absolutely believe that mental health professionals should be compensated for their labor and should, um, you know, take what they have to offer very seriously and, you know, know what you need to earn and, you know, figure that out. And also, um, yeah, I think it's also important to be thinking about how we can get people care in all the creative ways that we can, mm -hmm. the skills that mm -hmm. we have. Yeah, okay, wow. Yeah, that's, the numbers are impressive. So 17 countries, 40 states, yeah. over a thousand individual sessions, that's amazing. And the impact that you've made on so many people at a challenging time when they were already pr probably also isolated, right? So. Yes. What a powerful resource. What are you, are you, are you guys doing any surveys or, or collecting any data? I'm curious to hear what, what are some of the things people are saying about the impact yeah. of the support? I mean, the big thing that we're hearing these days is, is kind of going back to groups that people are finding that that has been a game changer. Mm -hmm. um, because right, not only have people been isolated from each other this year, um, but, COVID grief is specific, you know, I mean, I think mm. this is I'm speaking a little bit more from just my own opinion here, but like, you know, one could argue that many of these deaths have sort of like come at the hands of the state, right? Like there are a lot of things that may have been able to be prevented that weren't because of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the way that things were functioning at the time mm -hmm. when COVID hit, right? Right. And, um, you know, so that's really hard. And then also, um, yeah, I mean, so many of these deaths were really sudden, or really, you know, traumatic deaths in right. that way. Um, and uh, yeah, just for so many people to yeah. be losing family members who were completely and totally healthy. Um, right. It's just shocking. Um, right. And then, and then the up, go ahead. Well, just then to be living in an environment too, where throughout the past year, there's been, I mean, yeah, just a lot of denial of the seriousness of this. Right, um, right, right. So many people right. desperately wanting to go, quote unquote, back to normal. 
Mm -hmm. right? Like, Mm -hmm. and for so many folks who last submitted to COVID, that normal is gone, like forever gone. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to add to the other piece that I heard, particularly early on, was the, you know, connected to that COVID grief. And like, you know, the way you use it, that it's like when people were sick, they couldn't be with their loved ones yes. because, you know, concerns about infection. And then they weren't able to have funeral services or memorials in ways that you couldn't gather with people, your people in had that communal support. So I think that also has complicated that grief process for people. Absolutely. And and that is one of the big things that we're hearing from our young adults, both that that has been one of the most painful parts of this mm-hmm. and that being able to be in groups with each other has offered some mm-hmm. balm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you for your work and for the organization. We, you know, we definitely love to highlight again organizations that are doing great work around supporting mental health and to be doing that level of service that's absolutely free for folks um that is amazing so yeah let's continue to be in touch around that i'm curious as we're talking about grief um and you know for people in the audience or people listening you know, you know, I let's talk a bit about what does the grief process look like? We, you know, this is an impromptu thing here. So, and then like, what are some, you know, what are some things that you do to help the folks that come to you? Like, what are, what are some of the top two or three messages that you give people who are experiencing grief or dealing with grief? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. I mean, I think one thing is that like, the grief process looks different for everybody. Mm-hmm. Like, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. And so one of the things that is often helpful for folks to hear is like, you're not supposed to know how to do this. You're not mm-hmm. supposed to know how to grieve. And there is no one right way. Yeah. Um, and that if you can make room for whatever it is that you're feeling, yeah. Um, and be in relationship with folks who have capacity to like witness it and hold it um, that one way or another you'll be able to sort of guide yourself through um, yeah. but I think there is you know I think within the COVID network and yeah we share this belief that like on some level people have the tools that they need to heal mm-hmm. um, but we live in a world that so often discourages us from using those tools Mm. Um, but if you can really, yeah, just give yourself permission to make room for what is coming up for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It. Yeah. I love what you said. Like it's all, it looks different for everyone. Um, yeah. I remember having conversations like that because particularly when I worked with the adolescents, you know, you know, I'd have like a parent, you know, maybe a child lost a parent and is one of the but nobody was talking about the loss nobody was because nobody wanted to trigger each other's like grief process right um but that also that silence around it it's like sometimes people think well that person doesn't care or they've moved on right and so one of the things that I always say is like everyone's hurting and um but everybody's dealing with it in their own way yeah what are some, so you said you, you believe people have the tools. So what are some of those tools that we can tap into when, if, if we've experienced a loss, um, that, you know, maybe some go-tos that you've found helpful for people? I mean, I think people so often have um, a natural inclination toward really sort of like small scale ritual, mm-hmm. um, really noticing when they, um, are reminded of somebody and like letting themselves savor that mm-hmm. or um, you know really um, tapping into creative expression in one way or another to, to process a feeling that it might have been hard to talk about verbally or break down mm-hmm. um, I really think though like one of our primary tools is uh, our capacity to feel Mm. Um, and to really just let ourselves feel 
and that's feel exactly what you true. feel right feel yeah. what you feel yes and it's messy and yeah. you know I know at least I feel like I was socialized into a culture of um yeah there being uh I don't know just many things that it wasn't okay for me to express or oh anger that's that's a bad feeling you shouldn't have mm-hmm. that one or you know sadness well you can be sad for a certain amount of time but after then that's like really excessive Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. like I feel like I got all these messages and um no these feelings are coming up for a reason and the more that we resist them actually the longer they stay around yeah Um, so yeah um yeah and then I think the other thing is you know so often in grief we when we know that it's okay to actually have big feelings in relationship with other people, we want to be in community. Um, Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so really making space to connect, whether it be with like a volunteer group worker or a therapist or people in in your life, um, knowing that you don't have to be alone um, and uh, yeah, really reaching for folks. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Awesome. Awesome advice. Thank you for sharing that. So I want to shift gears a little bit. You know, one of the things that I find really important when we do these, when we have these conversations um, with the therapists and with mental health advocates is really about, again, part of it is humanizing us, right? Many of us, you know, many people have never seen a therapist, never been to a therapist. We make make up these images of what a therapist looks like or that they have all their life together, right? (laughs) Right, I know. So part of it is like, okay, let's talk about this stuff. We're, we're people too. We've, we've gone, we go through stuff just like you and we use strategies, you know, that we, we share with you. So I'd love for you to share, you know, personal struggle that you've experienced and talk to us about like, you know, what it was and how you were able to navigate through that experience. Yeah, I mean, one thing that comes to mind is, you know, I've, and this is something that I've seen with a number of clients too, is I, I feel like I was really like intensely indoctrinated into a family story and a family role. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, grew up almost with, I don't know, like a script for other people and myself about mm-hmm. how my family was, what my relationship was to my parents and sibling, like, um, and that everything was perfect and fine and wonderful all the time. Um, and that that was not just about kind of, I don't know who my family members are, but also about kind of culturally informed, my, you know, my, my parents were immigrants and I think that there was also, um, yeah, some, you know, real, some of their stories and the ways that they oriented their lives about this next generation things have to be a particular kind of way. So, mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think, um, when I think back, it's kind of wild to me how long it took for me to start to question things or Mm -hmm. to really get in into more authentic relationship with my actual experience of my own life Mm -hmm. um and um yeah I mean you know I do I do think for me therapy was a huge part of that journey which you know was part of what further solidified my interest in being able to do this. Um, But um, yeah, I mean, I just think uh, that sort of rigorous honesty with oneself can really be (laughs) hard to come to and can take time and unfold Mm -hmm. over time, right? Like I'm sure that there will be more that I, um, more more truths about myself and my own experience mm-hmm. of my life mm-hmm. that I come into relationship to over the next many years, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But I think even starting that journey in and of itself um, was really painful. It felt like mm-hmm. I was doing something wrong or, like, betraying my family mm-hmm. or, you know... By going to therapy. Yeah, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it was always such a strong message, like, you don't talk about our issues outside this house. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, at some point, it's just like, I think I have to, otherwise, mm-hmm. I'm not gonna survive this. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 What was your, um, if you don't mind me asking, um, 
for for many therapists, their first time being in therapy was because they were in a program that either required or strongly encouraged it. Was that your journey into it or had you experienced it before? No, yeah. I actually um, advocated to see a therapist for the first time in high school. Wow. Yeah, there were a lot of things kind of happening in, in my family that were really challenging and other things that were happening in my personal life that were challenging. And um, it just felt really clear to me that like I couldn't get the support I needed in the house. Mm-hmm. Um and yeah that was not an easy fight <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and but it sounds like you're if you won <laughs> I wanted it I really wanted it there was like a student assistance counselor at my high school that also helped advocate for it and gave, mm-hmm. um, you know like it wasn't it wasn't easy it didn't actually get easy like you yeah. know every week that I was driven to therapy it was like not fun mm-hmm. in that mm-hmm. part. <laughs> yeah um, yeah but it's something I wanted and yeah, I think I continued to pursue for myself once I was more independent. Yeah, you know it's so interesting. Thank you for sharing that that story and that experience because you know it really underscores. You know, I you know I've worked in a high school for seventeen years, and you know I've seen all types of stories, but definitely there is that story where a teen, you know, because we're in the school, you know, the the, the, the students see us in many roles. Um, and but we do have those situations where a student is advocating and the families know, right? There, there's this fear, right? All the negative messages we have, you know, the child is going to say something and you're going to be removed from the home, right? There are all these fears. Um, but right, and sometimes, you know, it, it is hard for the kids. Sometimes they don't get that access to that support because we do need parents to sign on and, and um, give consent for that. So it can be really challenging when we see that need and a student advocating for themselves but not having access to those resources. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think we're going to be seeing more and more of that too as like this current generation is so much more Oh my God. Friendly. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. More, but in New Jersey... Um, they allow students at 16 years old to consent for their mental health services. Mm. So I really was like, oh man, I want to do that for Massachusetts, right? Because, you know, they can consent for lots of others around their sexual health when they're 16. So why, why not their mental health? Yeah. So I think, like you said, we're going to see more, more, maybe more legislation around that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. So we just have a few more minutes. So, um, so you, so you talked about your own kind of childhood experiences, and then using therapy. So therapy was something that you use to help to navigate and to heal. Um, as we, let me see if there, and um, I think there are a couple of questions in the chat. So feel free, if, if folks, if there are questions that you have, um, feel free to drop them in the chat. And you know, again, if there's anything that you want to share with us that I haven't asked so far definitely let us, you know, feel free to pop that in there. So I have a question from Debbie. Um, um, this was, I think this was talking, this was when you were talking about um, your role, your work in the counseling center. Um, she was asked, she said, um, higher ed can be challenging. Um, I'm glad that you're enjoying college counseling. Do you receive consistent full support from your college leadership? Question. I mean, it's complicated, right? <laughs> um, I think anytime, I don't know, I mean, I just feel like anytime you're working for an institution, there are always so many competing priorities. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I do believe that the college genuinely cares about students' mental health. I also think the college genuinely cares about a lot of other things that sometimes conflict with students' mental health. And so that can be complicated. Um, mm-hmm. I will say, you know, I feel so grateful to work on kind of an incredible team. Um, and it's a small college and we have a pretty small staff and um, a small staff at the counseling service. And um, I just think we've done a lot of work over many years to stay in um, really functional working relationship with each other um, mm-hmm. and also do a lot of work around um, 
the ways that we interact with each other across our different identities. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been pretty powerful. Um, but yeah, do we receive full and consistent support from uh, from the college leadership? I mean, not all the time. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. and I love college students. It's, um, like such an incredible time developmentally. Um, so often young folks are just so wanting to learn about themselves and grow and have the intellectual capacity to really dig in, still have sort of like the open heartedness to form connections quickly. There's so many yeah. things changing so quickly. I mean, it's just, it's, um, it really feels like a privilege to get to work with folks in that age and stage you are really wanting it um, yeah and that's what's happening there yeah that's great so I know most um I'm, I'm gonna ask an opinion question so I know most college centers tend to only do more short-term work and then yeah. refer out mm -hmm. and I my guess is that's part of sustainability right if you have a school of over thousands I mean I know thousands of students you can't see everybody long term yeah what are your thoughts about kind of that model and is it always easy to refer out like yeah how does that kind of work and, and once someone like meets with you I'm sure they don't want to like leave right <laughs> yeah it is hard and so often um the folks who come to the consumer service most enthusiastic about doing the work um and who are really wanting therapy are the people who you can argue are perhaps even best to refer out because you know that they you know, we'll do it once you're linked up with somebody. Yeah, and yeah. And it's really sad to say goodbye to them. It's like, oh, this would have been so fun and interesting. And I like you, you know? <laughs> um, but I will say at, at Bryn Mawr, which, you know, it's about like eight miles outside of Philly um, in an area that is in the school itself is a, you know, primarily white, but predominantly white mm -hmm. institution. And it's in a community that's a pretty wealthy white area. Um, there aren't a ton of therapists of color nearby. And so, one of the other special things for me about working here is that, you know, I have been able to work with many students of color and um, that there's an argument that can be made for us being able to do longer term work because mm. there isn't necessarily a right. provider in the area. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, the, the model is challenging. Um, and I, I think in some ways there are, there are things that are sad about it for the clients and the clinicians. You know, mm -hmm. So many of us get into this work because we enjoy doing long-term work with people and it's right. hard not to be able to do that with everybody. Um, and of course, you know, many of the students would really appreciate the convenience of being able to see a therapist on campus every week and having that be it. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I do think that there are also advantages to being able to sort of see students as they need to be seen and make sure people are getting linked up to longer term care or hospital they're needing. Um, yeah. Because yeah, certainly there's a capacity issue there. Yeah, yeah, great. Great. Um, so this was wonderful, Catherine. Um, I really enjoyed learning, getting to you a little bit more, but also hearing about the COVID Grief Network um, support. So we definitely have to figure out how we can get you listed on our website because I definitely think that's a beautiful resource. Are you guys still taking referrals? Like how does the yeah. you yeah, are no, great. We're still um yeah we're still linking folks up for one-on-one -on -one support. We're still getting folks who want to be in groups into groups. Um, yeah. So yeah definitely that's excellent. That's amazing. So any last questions before we wrap it up? I think not. Um so yes yeah, so definitely um Shauna has posted in the chat on um, the, the COVID Grief Network um, Instagram page. Great. And um, I think you might've posted the website earlier, but we'll make sure we get that to folks. Um, and yeah, so we just, again, thank you so much for being here um, to kick off our, our BIPOC Mental Health Awareness Month. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, for our college students and in your private practice, busy lady. <laughs> so we will all, we will be back next week. Um, we can, we're continuing these conversations about um, BIPOC mental health. Um, next week we have Dr. Shannon Beach, who is a native psychologist in the Oklahoma area. So he'll be talking about the work that he's doing with indigenous folks in his community. So stay tuned. We love bringing you interesting conversations from folks who are doing really interesting and cool work. So 
again, thank you all for being here. And um, thank you um, um, for all of you for supporting InnoPsych. And make sure you listen to our net, um, NPR spot. It was re really cool. And again, continue to stay connected with us. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.